Uh, now, conflicts of interest, of course, uh, the mere thought of that sometimes gives us cold uh, shivers, uh, something that we don't want to uh, end up finding ourselves in. Uh, you know, it, it would be great uh, that uh, we spot these issues ahead of time. Um, sometimes, uh, even though we try to spot them ahead of time, um, they uh, can pop up uh, when we least expect it. Uh, but the, uh, the rule um, that uh, we have to be very cautious about is multiple clients. Whenever we have more than one client come to uh, talk to us about retaining us to represent them, red flags should, should come up because this is where, obviously, you can have potential conflict issues. Uh, when you're representing just one client, it's fairly easy. Uh, but often, in probate and trust litigation matters, as we know, there are more than one heirs. There are more than one litigant. And it could be multiple litigants, uh, depending upon the circumstances. And so when we have that situation, more than one person coming to seek our services, we have to do the basic review of the ethics rule and consider what potential issues do I have here. Now, 4-1.7, conflict of interest, current clients, uh, says uh, that the representation of one client, you, you, you basically cannot enter into an attorney-client relationship and represent a client if the representation of one client will be directly <laughs> adverse to another client or there is a substantial risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibility to another client, former client, or a third person, or by a personal interest of the lawyer. Uh, so obviously we know that the situation where uh, we, we have direct conflicts, uh, which uh, could, uh, could arise uh, in uh, probate litigation where uh, two different beneficiaries might have very differing interests in the, uh, in the estate. So we have to be uh, cautious of that uh, and have them uh, inform the clients that if a potential conflict does arise, you may have to withdraw as to uh, both clients. Uh, that's something for them to consider uh, before deciding whether they should have their own counsel. Now, notwithstanding the existence of a conflict of interest, a lawyer may represent the client if, one, the lawyer reasonably believes that the lawyer will be able to provide competent, diligent representation to each affected client, the representation is not prohibited by law, the representation does not involve the assertion of a position adverse to another client when you're representing both clients in the same proceeding, or, or excuse me, and the affected client gives informed consent confirmed in writing or clearly stated on the record. So even though um, there may uh, be uh, a conflict between clients uh, on some aspects of the representation, if the uh, general uh, positions of the clients are going to be consistent, uh, then the rule allows uh, the lawyer to continue the representation, uh, it's got to be confirmed in writing. Uh, obviously, it's better if you have the client actually sign uh, a consent and waiver of the conflict so that uh, there is no question they understand. Uh, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, attorney representing multiple heirs uh, with the same interest. Now, uh, you have to look at what their interests actually are, because a remainder man may have different view of how long to proceed on a probate litigation uh, matter than a specific devisee, all right? Because attorney's fees are going to be a big aspect of litigation, and that could substantially erode a remain remainder man's inheritance, whereas a specific devisee is going to get the same up front. So even though they're both heirs on uh, both heirs of the estate. Their interest potentially may uh, conflict down the road. Talk about the clients. Talk about that with the clients up front and, and get the proper uh, waiver. Uh, now, obviously, if a actual conflict develops, 
uh, you're going to have to withdraw no matter what. That's why it's important to always advise uh, clients in any multiple representation that if an actual conflict does arise, then the lawyer may have to withdraw as to everyone, and they will have to go out and hire a lawyer. All right, another example. Attorney asked to represent surviving spouse and children. Now, there's, there's obviously a lot of potential issues with this. Uh, the spouse and children, even though uh, they may appear to be lockstep in how uh, the, uh, for instance, uh, one example would be that the spouse and children are lockstep in an agreement that uh, person Y should not be the personal representative of the estate. It would appear that their interests are common in that regard. However, potential conflicts could arise. The spouse could decide they want to uh, do an elective share. Uh, that, that may interfere with the inheritance of the children. The children may have received some joint accounts. And those joint accounts may have to be used to pay the elective share. So, again, try to evaluate not only the current reason for why the parties want to hire you and have a joint representation, but speed up the, uh, the film, so to speak, as to what potential issues may arise during the course of that litigation and or uh, case so that you can identify those potential pitfalls where the interests may diverge and um, take uh, either uh, uh, talk about it up front and get a uh, sufficient waiver or uh, recommend that they get separate attorneys. Uh, now, the Florida Bar versus McKenzie case is, is a case I had cited in the materials. It's just a cautionary tale where a lawyer was publicly reprimanded for representing an heir and the personal representative of the same estate. Uh, now, the, the facts of that case are a little bit sketchy. Um, it, I'm assuming from the case that there were two different, uh, the, that the uh, heir and the personal representative were different persons. Uh, it's not clear whether an actual conflict actually arose, but it is, again, something to seriously consider um, before uh, getting yourself into a situation um, where uh, potential conflicts may arise. Now, as a personal representative or a personal representative in an estate owes fiduciary duties to that estate, you as the lawyer, you represent the personal representative. Uh, so, uh, theoretically, if that personal representative owes fiduciary duties to all of the heirs, and of course we know you can't pick and choose the heirs you like, you have to treat them all equally. Uh, representing the personal representative and another heir uh, is a potential problem. Um, now, consider one uh, scenario, though. Say you have a uh, personal representative and a, and a sole remainder man that uh, want to defend a will contest by a third party. Um, is there a conflict of interest there? Um, would it seem like that? Uh, because they both would have a joint interest in upholding that will. Um, and in that circumstance, uh, if you believe that uh, you want to go forward with that joint representation, I would suggest from a practical matter to file a motion with the court and get an order saying, they're putting everyone on notice, so if anyone's going to object, flush out the objections early on and get an order saying that that joint representation uh, is approved. Um, it certainly uh, could save you headaches later on if, uh, if uh, someone tried to disqualify you or opposing counsel tried to disqualify you at a later time. Now, um, a PR has to act as a fiduciary. Uh, but PRs, as we know, uh, can also be heirs, and they also can be creditors of the estate. So um, they a lot, oftentimes will file claims against the estate. Now, in circumstances where it's like payment of funeral expenses, probably no one's going to object, and probably there's no issue with the lawyer filing that claim. But where there are objections and where it is in controversy, uh, then the personal representative's personal interest needs to be uh, represented separately. 
so in those circumstances um, where uh, a PR uh, may be pursuing uh, a claim or may uh, have a uh, particular <coughs> construction of the will that benefits her over the other heirs, uh, it's probably proper to get uh, separate representation for uh, the personal representative's personal interest and personal claim. Uh, so, you know, obviously the personal representative is wearing two hats. And uh, you, you, even though they're the same person, their interests are different. They have a fiduciary duty to the estate, uh, but they also have their personal interests. And that is the reason why, in those situations, uh, they should be separately represented. One lawyer for uh, representing them uh, with regard to the uh, estate issues and the other with regard to advocating their personal claims. Um, all right. Uh, Drafting, uh, let's talk about disqualification with a, and, and a drafting attorney. Uh, oftentimes, on will contest cases, the drafting attorney will be called as a witness. And this is a potential problem that uh, sometimes a drafting attorney uh, finds himself in uh, where they may be defending the will contest. Uh, obviously, you've got to think twice before you take on the role as a lit litigator if you're the attorney that drafted that will. Uh, let's look under, uh, let's look at 4-3.7, which is the rule with regard to when a lawyer can testify. <coughs> lawyer shall not act as an advocate at a trial in which the lawyer is likely to be a necessary witness on behalf of the client, unless testimony relates to an uncontested issue. Two, the testimony will relate solely to a matter of formality, and there is no reason to believe that substantial evidence will be offered in opposition. Three, the testimony relates to the nature and value of legal services rendered in the case, or four, that this qualification works as a substantial uh, hardship. And in Section B, uh, it just says that if the lawyer uh, can't do it, and if the firm can't do it as well. So, um, you know, when... Um, uh, say that uh, the lawyer who drafted the will just needs to uh, substantiate, it's not a self-proving will, it's two witnesses, uh, he, he just needs to substantiate that the will was signed with formalities of the will statute. No one's going to contest that, or, there, or, or at least no one's going to introduce evidence in opposition to it. Uh, that's, that's okay. Um, the other uh, scenario, though, is uh, the... Uh, <coughs> Will is at issue, that the allegation is that the testator was either incompetent or was subject to undue influence. Uh, circumstances were that the lawyer perhaps uh, allowed uh, one of the beneficiaries to be in the room at the, at the will signing ceremony, and now the opposing counsel is calling the, the will drafter uh, to testify with regard to particular acts that he's trying to show uh, uh, under the carpenter factors of undue influence. Uh, you know, that's a circumstance then that a lawyer uh, is, is going to be disqualified from advocating uh, in, the, uh, in the case. And just, uh, just so uh, we understand, and I'm going to uh, have a slide about this in just a second, it's the, ad, it's the advocating in the trial mode. So it's not pre-trial, it's not post-trial. It's actually being an advocate at trial that is prohibited. Now, sequestration, I, I bring this up only because it's relevant. Imagine if you're litigating a case and you're called as a witness, but then, of course, the lawyers invoke the rule. Well, it's kind of hard to advocate at trial if you're not allowed to be in the courtroom. So this is another reason that you have to be real careful not to be in the situation. Under 90.616, you can keep out witnesses <coughs> from legal proceedings so that you can't have, uh, they can't hear the other parties testify. Uh, so you know, long ago when I, when I first started uh, practicing, everyone talked about invoking the rule. You know, there was no rule, and, and now 90.616, two years back, was uh, enacted to uh, give us a rule by which we can ask the court to keep out witnesses. All right, so as I mentioned, 
you know, the key consideration is disqualification occurs upon trial advocacy. And these two cases uh, point that out. So uh, a drafter of a will technically can do uh, discovery, can do pretrial motions, uh, and can even do post-trial motions, perhaps with regard to a word of attorney's fees or something. It's just during trial they are disqualified. All right. Uh, this is the example I gave earlier about the will drafter uh, supporting that the, the will was properly uh, executed. Um, and, and another example would be ambiguity in a will. If opposing counsel is calling you to support some of the carpenter factors, that's a, that's a problem. All right. Uh, under 90.5021, we have a codification of the fiduciary lawyer client relationship. Uh, as mentioned before, a personal representative, a trustee, all have fiduciary duties to, uh, to the estate and or to the trust. And a lawyer uh, under Florida law represents the personal representative. So in order to make it very clear, and especially with regard to people who are not represented by lawyers, um, the privilege applies to, uh, or communications by the lawyer uh, with the personal representative uh, are subject to the uh, fiduciary lawyer-client privilege. A communication between a lawyer and a client acting as a fiduciary is privileged and protected from disclosure, disclosure uh, just as if they were an individual. So even though they are a fiduciary for an estate that is theirs, the privilege is with the individual. <clears throat> Likewise, under 736.0813, uh, the uh, privilege is with the trustee, and this statute uh, requires that a trustee give notice within 60 days to qualified beneficiaries that the fiduciary lawyer-client privilege uh, under 90.5021 applies with respect to the trustee and any attorney employed by the trustee. Now, oftentimes, when you're dealing with unrepresented uh, beneficiaries or, or other heirs, and, and part of the purpose of giving notice to the beneficiaries and qualified beneficiaries is so that the non-lawyer will understand, hey, just because the, the lawyer represents a trustee does not mean that he's a lawyer for me as a beneficiary, or just because the lawyer is personal representative's uh, lawyer doesn't mean he represents me uh, as an heir. Um, so this, this helps make the, uh, uh, that, that the privilege is applying only with regard to the individual personal representative uh, to uh, avoid any confusion. All right, potential payment issues. And I love this little comment that I put on here on the slide. How many lawyers does it take to change the light bulb? Hourly or flat fee? All right, this is a great little introduction into the fact that I'm going to be talking primarily about hourly uh, fee agreements, not contingent fee agreements. Uh, contingent fee agreements are, of course, subject to some other rules under the bar rules. Uh, but regardless, fee agreements always should be in writing. Uh, and the reason for this is it's really simple, so that there's no misunderstanding between you and the client as to what the fee agreement is, and what your hourly rate is, and what you charge for cost, and and uh, so forth. Um, and also to make it clear that you're not working on a contingency. Uh, it, we'll talk about it a little bit later, that sometimes you, you end up in a de facto contingency, but generally speaking, you're trying to establish with the client who's representing you in a probate or trust litigation that regardless of the outcome, you, you're going to pay me an hourly rate. And there's often a difference sometimes between what a client has paid you in fees and what you may be able to recover in the litigation. And uh, it's important that you tell the client up front that, he, you know, we'll, we'll try to recover your attorney's fees in this litigation from uh, the trust or from the estate, uh, but the court may not award all the fees uh, that you pay us. And if that's the circumstances, then you still owe us uh, 
uh, the services that we have provided to you. So I would suggest that you put in something to, uh, to the effect of this example of just making it clear and, and um, uh, uh, talking or, or bringing it to the client's attention uh, that this could be the case and that, uh, you know, again, uh, it's not uncommon for many different reasons for a court to award you less than what you have actually expended, uh, be it just the equities in the case or otherwise. Of course, you know, your fee, overall fee, still has to be uh, uh, reasonable and fair and compliant with the Florida Bar Rules. All right. Luckily, the political election is over, so we don't have to worry about who pays the richest 2% or the rest of us. But for purposes of probate and trust litigation, who pays is a very important issue. Actions for breach of duty or challenging fiduciary powers are an area where the court is going to award fees uh, under 733-6091. And all actions for breach of fiduciary duty or challenging the exercise of or failure to exercise the personal representative's powers, the court shall award taxable costs as in chancery actions, including attorney's fees. Well, you ask, what are chancery actions? Chancery actions are essentially uh, a court of equity, court of equity, which, as justice requires, orders the costs, follows the result of the suit portion costs between the parties or require all costs be paid by the prevailing party. The court can essentially fashion a remedy however it wants, not without limitations, not without a standard of review, use of, of discretion, but generally can do equity as the case demands. Likewise, um, under 736-1004, in all actions for breach of fiduciary duty, the exercise or failure to exercise a trustee's power, or with regard to trust modification, judicial construction, termination of a trust, reformation of a trust, combination division of trust, or disapproval of a non-judicial act by a beneficiary, the court shall award taxable costs, as in chancery action. So again, if with any of those items uh, or actions that I just described, the statute says the court shall award costs. So um, when, when litigation is filed, be it in probate or trust proceedings, uh, who pays the ultimate price of that litigation is a very important issue, and one of which uh, will probably uh, be hotly contested uh, at the end of the case. Now, it's real important to, to understand and something that I would suggest you caution the client ahead of time so, so that you give them full disclosure, that the court can even award fees against a party's interest in a state of trust and even enter a judgment against them if they don't have an interest. So, if, for instance, if they lose a will contest and they're not a beneficiary, the court can award a judgment against them fees. Now, there's been some recent cases about this that's not in the outline that I just want to bring up because, you know, the statute uh, does not really give a standard by which the court uh, can award fees against a particular share or entry of a judgment. Um, now, there's some case law out of the 4th District, and I'll, I'll give you the site. It's Jerry, G-E-A-R-Y, versus Butzel Long, B-U-T-Z-E-L. L-O-N-G, and the site is 13 Southern 2nd, I'm sorry, 13 Southern 3rd, 149, so 2009 case. And it, it, what it suggests here is that in order for a court <clears throat> to award a judgment for fees against a probate or trust litigant or against their interest, there has to be a really good reason, such as frivolous litigation uh, or bad faith. Um, now, again, that's not in the statute, but that it may be some case law uh, you consider, depending upon what side of the fence you are on, um, and I believe there's some other cases uh, from the fourth as well. Now, there's a very new case that came out this year uh, called um, Jacobson versus uh, Skylar, uh, and it's 92 
Southern 3rd 228. It's uh, July 2012. It came out of the 3rd District. And it's a case where basically uh, co-trustees did not distribute money to uh, an heir from the trust that was uh, entitled uh, to, uh, to a distribution. And the beneficiary sued the co-trustees and won. And the co-trustees used all the money to pay for their attorney's fees. And there was insufficient amounts left in trust to pay the award of attorney's fees that the court made. So the court entered a judgment against the co-trustees. And the appellate court affirmed that um, in so much that uh, the, um, the uh, co-trustees had uh, breached their fiduciary duties uh, in that regard. Uh, now, there's an interesting concurrence and a dissent uh, in this case. And the dissent raised the issue that the co-trustees were not before the court in their individual capacity. They were before the court in their rep representative capacity as co-trustees. So the dissent said, well, how can you enter a judgment against them personally unless you brought a separate action that names them personally? Interesting issue. Of course, that was the dissent, but something to think about. This case law is going to, of course, develop, I think, quite uh, quite uh, frequently, uh, given uh, how hot of it, uh, uh, an issue attorney's fees uh, and awards are. All right, let's talk about pleading requirements, because they are different, and it's important to note that probate litigation is different from trust litigation in this regard. <clears throat> actions involving uh, trust are regular civil actions that are subject to the rules of civil procedure. You have to plead your entitlement, just, under, uh, just like under uh, Stockman versus Downs, which uh, litigators know to be uh, the, you know, the leading Supreme Court case. It says basically, if you don't ask for attorney's fees in your pleadings, you're not going to get it. So if you're bringing an action to set aside a trust, plead your entitlement to attorney's fees, or you could be barred. And uh, don't forget about rule of civil procedure 1.525. This rule says that in order to obtain an award of attorney's fees, you have to file that motion within 30 days of the final judgment or you are barred. Very important to remember. Uh, and actually, I, I got that, uh, uh, the, the corollary uh, rule is uh, 5.0. Uh, 025 in the uh, probate litigation uh, uh, rule book. Under, under probate litigation rules, uh, once a proceeding is declared an adversarial proceeding, the rules of civil procedure apply except for rule 1.525. So in probate litigation cases, the 30-day rule to file a motion for attorney's fees is not applicable. All right, notice to trustees. Under 736-1005, the lawyer has to give reasonable notice to a trustee in writing that he has been retained by an interested person and he's, and he's looking to get paid. So basically, you have to give notice to the trustee that, hey, I've been retained by a beneficiary and I am going to seek my attorney's fees so that the trustee has fair notice of that. All right, so the flip side now is the estate uh, litigation arena. Um, under 733-106-3, application for fees, there is no deadline given for filing that. Uh, technically speaking, the Stockman requirement are inapplicable to uh, claims and probate proceedings. And these are a few cases that say that. So you don't technically have to plead your right to an award of attorney's fees in probate matters. However, I would recommend that you do, just to be safe and just in case case law changes. So, uh, you know, ask for it and you will receive it. If you don't ask for it, you may not receive it. All right, now, it's also real important to understand where the money that you're receiving for your attorney's fees comes from. 
Because if you're in a situation that we're going to talk about in just a minute, that, that the money is coming from the trust, and there's an objection pending that um, the a beneficiary is objecting for you, or objecting to your fees being paid from the trust due to a breach of fiduciary duty case or otherwise, then you could be susceptible to having to pay back those fees. So I have a little funny clip here, which uh, may or may not, you may or may not be able to hear, that uh, just was a, nice, a good reminder to uh, watch where the money's coming from. Money! I need to feel you, Jerry! Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! So from Jerry McGuire, show me the money. Know where it's coming from. All right. Um, now, it used to be um, that when a breach of fiduciary duty case uh, was filed in a, in a trust litigation matter, uh, case law had held that uh, you could not pay attorney's fees from the trust until you got court authority. Now, under the, uh, the trust statute, uh, that changed. 736-0802 says a trustee is authorized to pay attorney's fees and costs without approval of court unless the court orders otherwise. So what's the procedure in this? If you, if your trustee has been sued for breach of fiduciary duty, um, you want to give notice that um, you intend to pay the attorney's fees from the trust. If the other side, the beneficiaries or whoever, uh, want to stop the trustee from paying attorney's fees from the trust, they have to file a motion, and they have to obtain a court order. So it's not merely filing a motion. That doesn't do it. It's, it's obtaining the court order. However, once they file the motion, if they do obtain the court order, guess what? Any, any attorney's fees paid after that motion was filed, lawyer has to be disgorged. So be cautious. And I would recommend that if you give notice and the other side files a motion to stop the fees from being paid, have your client pay you from their personal funds. Yeah, so if an order is entered, then any previous payments have to be refunded. All right, now just because, um, just because an order may be entered does not mean you're prohibited from going back to the court after the trial and asking for your fees. Now let me just mention something uh, with regard to this procedure. In essence, what the party who's trying to stop you from using fees from the trust to pay for the litigation, what in essence they have to show is the same type of standard that you would uh, have to show in a preliminary injunction. Basically, the, the, that you have to make a reasonable showing by evidence in the record or by proffering evidence that shows a reasonable basis for the court to conclude that there has been a breach of trust. Now, this is a hugely important hearing. This could actually be the entire case because if you are a beneficiary and you are able to cut off a fund, a source of funding, uh, the defense for the trustee, that gives you great leverage. So I suggest to you that these mini trials, as I call them, are all critical in trust litigation and um, uh, really should be given close attention. That's all I have for this section. I will be back uh, in the last part for uh, ADR.